today's session is going to be presented by Mr. Sujan Roy, and it's my pleasure uh, and privilege to invite Sujan to do this session. Sujan heads currently the international business for passenger vehicles for Tata Motors, and uh, his resume reads like a, a, a list of automobile majors across the world. He has got over 30 years of experience with various automotive majors in marketing and sales, and some of his previous employers include Mercedes, Volkswagen, Honda, Mahindra, like I said, uh, and Lexus. Like I said, mostly a uh, list of automobiles that we either see on the road or see on a list of top automotive companies across the world. Uh, Sujan is very passionate about what, whatever he does, a technophile, a traveler, and an award-winning writer. And most importantly for my, uh, from my side, uh, he's been a two-time national level finalist in humorous speeches with the Toastmasters International. An eternal optimist, as he likes to call himself, Sujin is gonna to talk to us about careers. Sujin, uh, thank you for joining us, and I am going to uh, hand over to you. Uh, over to you, Sujin. Thank you, Kaushik. Uh, such a pleasure to be here on this forum, talking to all of you. And uh, indeed, it is, it is uh, such a, a unique experience to be learning from home to be connecting from home, to be uh, able to experience new things sitting in the safety of our own houses. The technology existed, we just never experienced it before, I guess. Without uh, further ado, shall we start? Apna uh, time aega. This is a very uh, uh, celebrated line from the movie Gully Boy, which is about struggle. And the reason I chose Apna Time Aiga is uh, because the movie is about a person who's, who comes from being a nobody to become somebody. And that is what all of us have aspired for. Uh, if you look at my educational background, it is nothing high polluting, uh, no uh, great uh, organization, uh, what to say, uh, educational institutions. Uh, so it has been a struggle. And uh, the struggle has taught me certain things. I have tried to assimilate the 13 most important things, which especially are relevant in these times where every professional, every person who earns a living is worried about what comes next. Uh, how shall I keep being relevant to the organization that I work for? How do I keep being uh, a person who delivers more than the uh, what is expected of me. And these are the 13 steps which helped me immensely in my journey. And I begin. Next. I begin with a story. My entire presentation is a series of stories. The reason I choose this medium is a stories predate uh, ideas in the human mind. When man began sharing ideas, he started sharing them as stories. We tend to remember stories, we tend to relate stories, and we are able to make them usable in our daily lives with stories. There was a young boy who was walking down the street when uh, some city dwellers were passing him by. He was blocking their path and they said, get out of the way, you worthless boy. So the child was offended. He came running to his father, who was a wise farmer, and said, Father, what is my worth? The farmer looked at his son and gave him a stone and said, Son, take the stone. Go to the marketplace. Stand in the middle of the marketplace, holding the stone high aloft your head, and say nothing. If someone wants to buy the stone and they ask, him, uh, ask you what it is worth, just show them two fingers. Say nothing. See what they offer you. And don't sell them the stone. Come running back to me and tell me what happened. So the boy, as instructed, took this wondrous looking stone and stood in the middle of the marketplace holding it aloft. Before long, a shopkeeper walked up to him and said, boy, you are trying to sell this stone? He nods his head. How much will you sell it for? The boy puts two fingers up. The merchant removes two coins and it says, here, take this. Give me the stone. The boy is tempted to sell the stone, but he takes the stone as his father had said, runs back to his father and tells him what happened. The father says, fine. Now take the stone, go to the museum, stand in the grand hall of the museum, 
holding the stone aloft and do the same. The boy goes to the museum before long. A lady who looks like she is wise and well-read walks up to him and she says, Oh, this wondrous stone, I have been searching for it for so long. You're selling it? The boy nods it. How much will you sell it for? The boy puts up two fingers. He says, it seems fair. And she takes out two gold coins and offers it to him. The boy is tempted, but his father had said, don't sell it. So he comes running back to his father and says, father, father, I was offered two gold coins. Should I go and sell it? The farmer says, no. Now take the stone. Go to the jewelry section of the grand market at the capital. So the boy travels all the way to the capital, goes to the jewelry market and stand there with the stone held up aloft on his head. After some time, one of the jewelers comes to him and says, oh, this gem, I have been searching for it so long. It will form the centerpiece of the emperor's crown. I have been find, searching high and low for the stone. How much will you sell it for? And the boy holds up two fingers. And the man says, yes, 200 gold coins is just about right for the stone. And the boy is shocked. He runs back to his father and says, Father, Father, I was just offered 200 gold coins for the stone. What it leads us to, the moral of the story is that it is for us to sell ourselves where we are valued the most, to make ourselves into something where we are valued the most. The product is the same. It is how we shape ourselves. It is how we finish ourselves. It is how we present ourselves. So that was story number zero, the setting the preamble. Next, please. The most important thing which will decide whether we are a successful person, whether we are a fulfilled person, are these two words, bhuk and zid. Those of you who do not understand Hindi or Urdu, uh, yeah. apologies to them, the close approximations in English is hunger and determination. But bhuk and zid best decides the kind of fire in the belly that a person needs and the sheer obstinacy of keeping going despite the odds despite the circumstances, despite all the things that come against. The first image that you see is that of celebrated violinist Yehudi Menuhin. One day, Yehudi was finishing his concert and a lady walked up to him and said, Yehudi, what a fantastic concert. I would give my life to play like you did. Yehudi smiled and said, ma'am, I just did. Look at the second picture. This is a lady who was born with no arms. She wanted to be a pilot, and she recently got the license to fly a plane without use of arms, using only her legs, and she flies solo. You feel we have challenges? Look at the challenges they feel, they, they uh, uh, fight against. You know of many people who run without feet. It is, it is, just the book and the zid. A billionaire was asked by an interviewer how hard a person needs to work to become a success. The billionaire said, not very hard. You just need to work half a day. The incredulous interviewer said, half a day? That cannot be. The billionaire clarified, yes, 12 hours a day, seven days a week seems okay. I don't think you need to work harder than that. Next. Working hard is important, but more important is working on what? I had a very illustrious boss in, in one of my previous organizations. He's quite a senior person in the auto industry. Uh, he was usually the a person who followed me into the office. I would be the first person in. And he one day made a comment that, Sujan, you work on a lot of things. You are always busy, but many of the things that you do are worth nothing to me or the organization. So I decided uh, to set up a game along with him. He said that every morning when I come in, you will tell me the 10 top things which are the most important things that I want of you. And every day after that, the morning uh, when he would come in, he would come up to my desk and I would tell him 
the first most important thing you want of me is that report completed. The second thing is you wanted clarity on this. The fourth thing I had to do this, 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 and I would tell him the 10 things. Earlier on, in the first few days, I would not get even one thing which coincided between my list and his. But eventually, it got to be closer and closer. And eventually, at the end of the month, what happened was uh, I would often say some things that he wouldn't remember. Oh, item number seven, I had not uh, thought of that. I had forgotten that. So in that one month, I learned that I didn't have to work on many of the things. Many of the things that I was doing was absolutely worthless from the point of view of my immediate superior or my organization. What I needed to work on, what my priorities had to be, had to be the ones which my immediate superior wanted me to do. And that is what I try and do. Every morning, I ask myself, what are the 10 most important things which is important from the point of view of my immediate superior and my organization? And if at the end of the day, I have some things left over, and often I do, that is the, uh, is the thing which is nice to do. But these 10 things are my priority. Even if you're self-employed, you need to get on to asking yourself, what are these 10 things that I need to work on right now? Next, please. The 10 things was a story of focus. And that brings me to the current atmosphere of negativity, people worrying about the economy, what will happen next, all sorts of politics in office. They are going to you know, sack off so many people. This person is going to get promoted. That is going to happen. This is going to happen. There was a student who asked his guru, who is the Maharishi of Maharishis? Who is the best of Rishis in your opinion? So his guru said it is King Janak. The student laughed incredulously. King Janak, but he's a king. He lives in a royal palace with luxury and pomp and finery. How can he be a Maharishi? So the guru smiles and says, why don't you go and ask him yourself? So the boy goes King Janak's court and asks him, my guru told me that you are the finest of the Maharishis. I don't believe him. Can you tell me why you are the finest of the Maharishi? King Janak was infuriated. He said, guards, take this young man, give him a bowl of oil, fill it till the brim with oil and take him on a tour of the palace. If he drops even a single drop of oil from this bowl, we head him instantly. So the guards took this boy with a bowl filled of oil around the palace. And finally, he didn't drop a single drop of oil and they brought him back intact to King Janak. The king asked him, so did my soldiers take you to the treasury? Did you see the gold and the gems and the jewels? He says, no. Did my uh, soldiers take you to the armory? Did you see the fearful weapons of war? He says, no. Did they take you to the horse stables where you saw the most beautiful horses and elephants tethered? He says, no. So what did you see? I gave you a full tour of the palace and you came back seeing that you saw nothing. The boy is a little upset and he says, that's because I was focused on this bowl of oil. If I dropped a single drop, these chaps would have beheaded me. And King Janak laughs and says, that's why I am a Maharishi. I may stay in a palace. I may stay in luxury. But I am focused only on my task, which is the welfare of my people. I am always looking at the bowl. I am oblivious to the pleasure, the luxury, the comfort around me. And that is why perhaps your guru said that I am a Maharishi. And that is what is very necessary in this day and age, where uncertainty is a greater virus than corona where all sorts of negative thoughts surround us, we have to look at our bowl of oil and avoid a single drop of oil from spilling on the floor because then we will be beheaded. Next, please. Mere baap ki company, my dad's company. Think like you own it. One of the things that I do whenever I join a company, whenever I'm employed by a company, is I buy a lot of shares, more than I can afford to own. So that it provides focus to me. I start thinking like an owner. Whatever I do is going to either add to my wealth or it is going to hamper me financially. You know, an owner, if it's your house, you will take special care of it. You will feel for it. You will genuinely have a sympathy, a connection to it. 
your first car or your first bike remember how beautifully you kept it how much you used to mind if someone you would dirty it or even sit on it that is what ownership is and ownership of the job ownership of the company that you work in is very important that is why you need to think that ye mere baap ki company this is my dad's own company you are the owner of the company the second image is that of a broken sculpture that brings me to a word in latin called sincere sin without sincere wax the word in english sincere comes from without wax in the good old days of the roman empire when sculptors would sculpt a slab of marble one wrong tap of the chisel and there would be a mistake in the sculpt the sculpture that they were making the good sculptors would throw away the piece of marble start from another block of marble and start carving the guys who were not all that good they would hide their mistakes with wax and continue with their sculpture which is why the good sculptors came to be known as sincere without wax it is necessary to be without wax if we have to succeed without wax to our people without wax to our bosses without wax to our company and more than anything else without wax to ourselves when we look at ourselves with at the mirror are we with wax or without wax next please for the last 9 years i have been looking after exports and i have come in close proximities with uh, the nepalese market and there was something that they taught me to become a gurkha the gurkhas are not particularly physically strong they are five foot something they're tough but they're not physically strong they're not intimidating they're not you know fearsome to look at they don't have fearsome weapons yet the gurkhas are prized for uh, their fighting skills and are amongst the best soldiers ever known to come anywhere in the world and are in multiple armies including the indian army and do you know what is the battle cry of the gurkha regiment it is hoy ke hoy na ho 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 hoy ke hoy na is the question which is asked those of you who know nepali uh, the question is will it be done or won't it and the answer is ho 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 yes 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 what is to be done is not defined will it be done or won't it the answer is always yes and that is what is the spirit of the nepalese my nepalese team when ever a challenge is thrown to them they do not low ball they don't say that it cannot be done it cannot be done because it is not possible because this that more often than not before the month is over on the 28th of the month they will call me and tell me sujan sir ye to ho gaya aapne bola tha humne kar de diya and they don't balk at challenges it is not that they are able to meet the challenges that i throw at them 100% of the time but one thing never ever do they challenge the challenge they don't say that this cannot be done because the answer is always ho 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 sometimes they miss the target like everyone does but one thing that defines a gurkha is they are not never smaller than the challenge the challenge is always smaller than them and that is why it is necessary when a target is given when a challenge is given by whether it is fate whether you are superior whether your company the answer for me is always ho 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 the challenge is not bigger than me i am bigger than the challenge i will give it my best if it happens well and good if it doesn't happen i can look at myself in the mirror and say that i have given it my best next please and this is possible only if you are willing to leave the comfort zone it is very easy to look at linear growth to look at that last year i did 1000 so this year uh, maybe with uh, better prospects i can do 1100 oh there is corona virus so let let me cut out three months of it i will do 800 no earlier on sailors used to stick around the coastline and they would always sail with one eye on the coastline the earliest of sailors who used to cross the ocean lose the sight of the shores are the ones who found new destinations which is why christopher columbus said you can never cross the ocean unless you have the courage to lose sight of the shore you have to get out of the comfort zone the growth occurs beyond the comfort zone very often 
your organization or the situations will give you challenges which have got nothing to do with your past experience, your learning, your knowledge. The answer is always ho, ho, ho. That's because when you pick up a challenge, something that you've never done, something that you have never experienced, something that the company trusts you to do, or perhaps because you are the only person standing, you acquire a new skill, you acquire a new ability. Try and imagine that you are asked to go on a dangerous, perilous uh, journey, and you are given the choice to pick up just one implement. What would you do? do? Would you pick up a knife? Would you pick up a hammer? Would you pick up a saw? Or would you pick up a Swiss knife? You would pick up a Swiss knife because it's got multiple implements. Yeah, that also counts as one implement. And that is what happens when you go beyond the comfort zone. When you pick up new projects that have never been done before. When you pick up new skills that you have never acquired before, you become a Swiss knife. You become more valuable to yourself and to the company. And especially in environment like this, the new skills are what might be the deciding factor between whether a person gets promoted or chopped. Next, please. Enthu Cutlet. Those of you who are from Mumbai might have heard this term. Enthu Cutlet is a person who is game for anything. He is game for a picnic at 3 o'clock in the night. He is the guy who is willing to try a one-act play, who is going for a stand-up comedy show, who is willing to meet up friends next Friday. Whatever. He is the Enthu Cutlet. He is positive. He is there for it. The first picture is that of American singer Nat King Cole. It was 1950s and Nat King Cole was performing in a small town. As he walked up to the auditorium, a ragged looking lady stopped him and said, Mr. Cole, I have a small child who is dying of TB. I can't afford medicines for him. Could you give me some money? Nat King Cole removed all the money in his wallet and gave it to the lady. Went out to the auditorium, performed. After the performance was over, he was having a dinner with the town mayor and the town mayor said, uh, Mr. Cole, I'm very sorry to tell you, uh, you just got cheated by that lady. She is the town drunk and she has got no kid. She'll just blow it up on liquor. So Nat King Cole started laughing and the mayor was very surprised. What is this? I just told you you had been cheated and you're laughing. So Nat King Cole says, that's the best piece of news I've heard all month. There's no child dying of tuberculosis. The ability to look at the worst of uh, things with a positive mind to look at the positive outcome. It's a skill. It's like bicycling. It is like swimming. Work on it and you will see the positive side to everything. The second picture is about a young man who got caught in crossfire in a gangland shooting. It was not his fault. He happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time and he got shot multiple times. A lot of blood, you know, uh, uh, bled away from him and he was in a very serious condition by the time the ambulance reached him. As he was being placed into the ambulance, the medic asked him, Sir, are you allergic to something? The young man smiled and said, Yes, bullets. And the medic was shocked. After the young man reached the hospital, he was operated, he recovered in the ICU. When he regained his senses, the medic was sitting next to him. He said, I just stopped by to ask you one question. You were in very imminent uh, chance of dying. You had bled away, lost a lot of blood, and you were very close to death. You knew that, and I knew that. Yet you found the energy and enthusiasm to crack a joke when I asked you a question. How is that possible? So the young man said that when I looked into your eyes, I knew that you were afraid that I would die on your watch. I needed to give you the confidence that I was not going to die. I needed you not to give up on me which is why I cracked that joke. And that is being positive. And being positive is not something that you and I have to learn. We were born with it. Remember when we were kids, even the worst of setbacks, the worst of beatings, falling from a tree, being uh, run over by a bike, we would cry for five minutes and after that we would recover. We would jump around and play like these three kids are doing. We were positive people. What happened to us? If you walk into a kindergarten, and ask the class, who can draw, 100% of hands will go up. Who here can dance, 100% of hands will go up. Who here can sing, 100% of hands go up. The same class you visit in the 8th standard, ninth standard or later, you won't see hands grow up, go up. 
how was it possible that if 50 people in a class all knew how to sing, dance, draw, when they were in the kindergarten, by the time they went higher up in life, they forgot these qualities. All of us know how to draw. All of us know how to sing. All of us know how to draw. That's no one asked you that, can you sing like Lata Mangeshkar or M.S. Subalakshmi? Sing, yes, of course I can sing off-key. It is necessary to embrace the positive, to become the child that you always were. It is there deep inside. Let us rediscover. Next. Almost sanskari. Be the most courteous person you know. Let me talk about the most courteous person I know. I was in Mercedes-Benz those days and uh, the guy next to me, so I used to look at the cheapest or the best-selling model, both ways to look at it, uh, the C-Class. The guy next to me used to look after the really expensive imports, the sports cars and the really fancy cars, the customized uh, things, etc. This chap was approached by Mr. Tata's office uh, to uh, come and sh show Mr. Ratan Tata uh, the features of the latest uh, new car which had been launched. So this colleague of mine, he went from Pune, where the Mercedes-Benz uh, headquarters is, and he went down to uh, Mumbai, to Bombay House, and showed Mr. Tata uh, the brochure, explained the features. Uh, the expensive models are uh, seriously customizable. You can change the interiors, change the seats, change the tires, the wheel sizes, the alloy wheels, you name it. So he sat down patiently with Mr. Tata, explained everything, took his order, and came back to Pune. Two, three days after he came back to Mumbai, from Mumbai to Pune, he received a letter. He opened the letter and started screaming with joy. And when I asked him what's happened, I thought, I don't know what happened to him. He just showed the letter to me. He was not in a position to even talk. And when I looked at the letter, it was a personal thank you note from Mr. Tata himself. This man was a salesperson in an auto company who went to meet Mr. Tata. He was doing his job. There was absolutely no need to send him a Thank you note. But Mr. Tata is Mr. Tata. He found the time to write a thank you note to a lowly salesperson in an auto company. And if Mr. Tata can find the time and has the ability to be courteous, you and I certainly do. There was a man who was working in the food industry. Saturday, his place of work was closed, Saturday, Sunday. But he remembered something important. So he came Saturday, went to the deep freezer, he had to check on something. While he was in the deep freezer, the door closed by itself. And there was a certain death staring at him because uh, no one would come into the office until Monday morning. There was no way of opening the door from inside. And in the deep freezer, with, in the freezing temperatures, by Monday he would die. Within hours he would die. But after a few minutes, the door was opened from outside. And he was quite surprised to see the watchman outside. He said, how did you know I was here? The watchman said, uh, you are the only person who wishes me good morning when you come in and goodbye when you leave for the day. You had told me good morning, so I knew you had come in to work. But I hadn't heard from, from you for a very long time. So I came searching for you. And the freezer was the last place I looked in. And there you are. That is not necessarily the motivation to be courteous. The motivation to be courteous is that, especially in difficult times, you don't know how your good morning, <coughs> thank you, or goodbye is going to affect the lives of a person who's going through a very difficult time. Let us learn to be courteous. We have great examples in front of us. Be the most well-read person you know. Alongside on the slide, you can see the great people and how many books they read. But let me tell you the story of the rucksack, another Mr. Ratan Tata story. I have the privilege of receiving Mr. Tata at the Geneva Motor Show every year. This year, it was not held because of Corona, but last year was the last time when I received him at the Geneva airport. Mr. Tata came out of the airport, uh, out of the customs and he was carrying an ordinary rucksack on his shoulders and he said, uh, can I give this rucksack to you? I need to go to the washroom. I said, certainly, sir. So I reached out for the rucksack thinking that how heavy would it be? You generally, you know, at the back of your mind, you have a weight estimation. Not four kilos, five kilos. 
when I picked up the rucksack, I was shocked that it was at least 12 to 15 kilos. It was like it was filled with rocks inside and it was hard, you know, when I, when I picked it up. After some time, Mr. Tata's assistant also walked out of the customs and he saw me holding the rucksack. He said, Sujan, can I take the rucksack from you? I said, sure. Giving him the rucksack, I asked him, what does he carry in its stones? The assistant said that those would be his books. He travels everywhere with dozens of books, hardbound books. And that is when the penny dropped. If Mr. Tata, at the age of 80 plus, with the kind of success he has had, with the kind of knowledge and wisdom that he has, is still hungry to learn more. He travels with the dozens of books. He finds the time to read. Surely you and I can find the time to read more. Next, please. This, I think, I don't need to emphasize sufficiently. Be the dress, best dressed person you know. I'm not talking about the, the most expensively dressed. I'm talking about attention to how we dress. Do we dress appropriately for the occasion? Do we dress conservatively, classically? I'm not talking about cutting edge uh, dressing. I'm talking about to be dressed conservatively in a classic way, to pay attention to our suits and shoes, to be dressed well. Too many people these days dress shabbily. They think hard work, intelligence, craftiness shall make up for it, whereas the basics are overlooked, whether in a professional or a personal capacity. Let us always look the best dress that we know. Next, please. Subhash. Subhash means speak well. Be the best spoken person you know. Successful people are often good speakers. And I'm not talking when I'm saying speaking in a oratorially competent sense. Of course, the five people whose pictures are there, Swami Vivekananda, Winston Churchill, Nehru, Subhash Chandra Bose and our current Prime Minister are fantastic orators. Yes, it is a very good skill to acquire and have. But it is also necessary to smile, to speak softly, and to have energy. How will people find the enthusiasm and energy? Do we light up a room when we walk into it and speak the way a light bulb does? Where is the energy? And the final point is the old Chinese proverb. A person who does not smile should not open a shop. If you don't know how to smile, don't open a shop. And this applies not only to the salespeople. Today, every person is a salesman or a woman because the first thing that you're selling is yourself, your own self. Are you acceptable as a product to your superior, to your company, to your clients? Learn to smile. It, it's a wonderful quality. Learn to smile not only from your lips, from your eyes, from the warmth of your heart. Subhash. Next, please. Number 12 is embracing no. The world will slam doors on your face multiple times before you find someone who will open the door and be willing to give you a chance to pitch for whatever it is that you are selling, for whatever that is you want. But remember, you are beginning with no. You already have nothing. If you get it, you are in a positive position. You should not be shy of asking. Embrace no. No is your best friend. If you're not hearing sufficient no's, you're not trying hard enough. Remember to knock the door. Remember to put your foot through the door and try again, no matter how many times the door is slammed. Whatever it is that you wish for. And that is where I must tell you the story of this tank. Whenever in life you need a pistol, I don't know why you would need a pistol, but if you need a pistol, you need to apply for the license of a tank. This is what I found in my life. If you want a pistol, ask for a tank. Why? Because most likely the guy will tell you, tank, what do you need a tank for? You think tank comes for free? Here is a pistol, go and fight. So you wanted a pistol, you got a pistol, but you had to ask for a tank. But very often in your life, what will happen is there are so many people in the queue waiting for pistols but there is no one in the queue asking for a tank. There are some times in life that the chap will say, oh, you want a tank? There are many lying there. Go and pick the one which you want and drive it out. And then you wanted a pistol, but you ended up with a tank. It happens. It happened in my life. I will explain to you. 
during my first job, I was headhunted by a company in Oman, which was the Toyota distributor. They knew everything about me. They talked to me, they interviewed me, and they said, very well, sign in this form. The job is yours. I said, what job is this? They said, this is the perks and this is this. This is, this is what it will do. And what's more, when you get promoted, in the promotion, you will be in the next level, you will be getting a Toyota Corolla made in Japan. They were Toyota distributors, so their employees drove Toyotas. This was the 1990s, where there would have been hardly a few dozen Corollas privately owned in even the city of Mumbai. So a Toyota Corolla was a very big thing, especially since all I had was a bicycle. I didn't even have a motorized transport at that time. I was quite happy with the job that I was in. I didn't want to leave Mumbai and go to Oman. So I said, fine, uh, let me ask for a tank. I said, uh, I will sign on only if you give me that next level now, the job which has the Toyota Corolla. So the two people looked at each other and they said, okay, fine, sign here. That's it. They looked at each other and they said, okay, fine, sign here. I said, what do you mean? I said, we are giving you the next level. I said, uh, that, that's the one with the Toyota Corolla, right? I said, yes, sign here. And that is how I went from a bicycle straight away to a Corolla. Even to this day, I don't know how to ride a bike. I never owned a bike. So it is possible. Learn to ask for the tank. Which brings me to the next item on the list. Luck. Next, please. You can say, Sujan, you were lucky. It doesn't happen with everybody. You're right. This was once in a lifetime. But I can debate with you. Luck has happened to me again and again and again. Luck is 10% of what happens and 90% of how you react. Let me tell you the story of Karli Takax. Karli Takax was a soldier in the Polish army. This was the 1940s. And he was a very good pistol shooter. And he was aspiring to join the Polish national team to compete in the Olympics and win a gold medal. Hitler happened. The Nazis invaded Poland. War began. And Karli Takax found himself throwing a grenade. Only problem, the grenade exploded in his hand. And he lost his right hand. His right hand was just blown off. So, Karli Takax was lying there in hospital, minus one hand, and recovering. The war wore on. Eventually, Karli Takax recovered. After the war was over and peace returned, Karli Takax went back to the stadium where his colleagues who had survived the war, many of them didn't make it, those who survived the war were practicing pistol shooting and Carly walks in and all of them say, oh, Carly, what's happened to you? Oh, no, this is so terrible. They started commiserating with him and giving him their uh, you know, condolences. You sit down there, take a chair and give us tips. We will win the battle for you. He said, what nonsense. I'll sit there and give you tips how to win the medal. I'm here to compete with you guys. I said, what, Carly? Are you mad? You've lost your shooting hand. He said, so what? I still have my left hand. And Carly Takax went on to be one of the few shooters who changed his shooting hand and won multiple medals in the Olympics. 10% is what happens. 90% is how you react. Next, please. And that brings me to the final story. In the 90s, I, I was still a student and I was not doing very well with my studies. I was upset. Life was not going the right way. I had a friend who told me, Sujan, will you try a method? And trust me, it works. I said, what is it? What does it require? So he said, take a pencil, take a sheet of paper and write down all your dreams. Write down each and every dream that you have, what you want to be, where you want to go, what you want to own, what you want to experience, write it down. Write down 100 of your dreams. Don't stop until you write 100. So I started writing. And since the 90s, when I started writing, I reached maybe 55, 56 dreams. I haven't been able to go above that. I thought I would go into hundreds, but when you write it down, it is difficult. Even in so many years, I have not gone above 55, I think. What you do with the dreams is the next important part. So listen to me. What you need to do is after you write down the dreams, you need to look at each dream, every single dream, and touch, taste, see, smell, hear, be. Visualization. 
So want to go to Paris? Very well. You're standing underneath the Eiffel Tower. How does it look like? How's the weather? How's the air? Is it cold? Is it warm? Is it sunny? Is it raining? What does the air smell like? What are you wearing? What does it feel underneath your feet? Who's there with you? Visualize it, then go to the next point, then the third, then the fourth. Do that with your list at least once a week to begin with. Eventually, a little more infrequently is okay. My list since the 1990s currently lies in my phone. And I do this exercise. This process, this very simple process was later on made into a, a best-selling book called The Secret. It is available online in bookshops. You can go and read it, but the summary of it is just this. And my friend told it to me long before this book was written. And I can tell you that the dreams which you thought would never get fulfilled, no way. I want to have 55 Rolls Royces. That's not on my list. I'm just saying this for the heck of it. And since most of my dreams are connected to cars. So I want to have 55 Rolls Royces. For, for all you know, the Sultan of Brunei will make you his successor. The most ridiculous dreams get fulfilled first. Yes, Corolla was on my list, which is why I asked, give, give it to me and I will accept the job. And bingo. Within months, I was driving for a Corolla. The one which I thought would never get fulfilled got fulfilled first. And over the years, I have been sharing it with my friends, with my colleagues, with the people who I work with. And very often I get a call suddenly or a message. Sir, my most improbable dream number 11 got fulfilled today. It is necessary to do. And these are the 13 steps with one extra bonus step that I told you, which will help you live a more fulfilling professional life and to look at personal development. This is what worked for me. For you, it might be different. You might want to order it differently, but that is how I believe Apna time Aiga. Questions now. Thank you for the session. We have a lot of questions coming up. Um, the first one was from Vimal Vaklu. Uh, the question says that in case you only follow the boss's wish list, your company might lose some outstanding contribution from your side, which your boss had no idea about. What would be the best strategy to deal with that? Very, very rightly said. It is very often possible that uh, the realm of your possibilities is far, far beyond what your uh, boss's checklist is. But as far as your applicability to the organization is concerned, you start with the 10. After you finish your 10, all your skills, 11, 12, 13, can come up after that, definitely. It is in our error that we feel that there is a lot more which is possible with me. We lose sight of what is important to the priority of our immediate superior and our company. Thank you. The next question is from Shanta Kumar Balakrishnan. What is your suggestion when one of the project team members always tries to pull you down in a meeting, even though you're good to them? Uh, they do not listen to you, nor share the task updates, but directly report to the top management. You do not have control over their behavior. You have control only on your behavior. Uh, I think a person does uh, such things out of a loss of trust, uh, uh, insecurity within them. Uh, the antidote to insecurity is to provide more security. The antidote to mistrust is to give more trust. Uh, you, you have only control over your own tasks. You do not have control over what uh, your other colleagues do. And this is part of life. Uh, every, every person has people like this on their teams. And uh, you're not the first one who's experiencing them. Do your best until you can figure out how, can, how to do even better. It is their lives. They have their own lives. They have their own shoes to walk in. Whenever you come across difficult individuals, cut them some slack. You probably don't know what, what uh, how miserable their lives are that they behave this way. Thank you. Yes, that actually is a very, very good point. The next question is from Arjunit, who says, how do you approach a scenario wherein you're asked to do something for your boss but you don't think that it'll add value to the project and to your organization. 
very often uh, we uh, stop we stop being gurkhas because we overthink the problem uh, unfortunately india is a, a country which has very intelligent people uh, which is why we tend to overthink everything there are too many thinkers and too too, much, too many doers uh, too less doers uh, i think we need to do first and uh, not think it through so much if you go and ask a rickshaw puller uh, what are the things that modi needs to do better he will have an opinion the illiterate third fail fellow also will have a opinion of how modi can do it be better and this is something which is a problem with our country it need to stop overthinking and overdoing thank you uh, the other question was um, why does uh, this session talk about 13 specific stories is there any reason behind the number 13 uh, quite simply uh, when i looked at the list of things which i felt was important to make me uh, more happier with where i am today i won't say i'm a success i would say i'm happy with where i am today but i aspire for more which have helped me on my journey these were the most important steps yeah and i couldn't accommodate more than 13 in the time available uh, i'm sure a few more steps are there which i could have added these are the 13 more important most important and of these 13 um, is there any one or two which is like the key one if you have i have prioritize? included them in the order of their importance so hunger and grit the sheer determination to not uh, you know give up is the most the most important thing we give up too fast as a nation as a race thank you uh, so, this is a, sorry, so this is a question from me uh, throughout these stories are amazing and what i want to ask you is how important is is it to have a sense of humor and what can you do to you know slowly develop it if you don't have it already a uh, sense of humor is important because uh, it is not the most important thing you can do very well being deadpan serious also but sense of humor just makes the journey worthwhile uh, i remember i was on a terrible trek once it it was month of may and we had not carried sufficient water and it was very very physically straining we wouldn't have finished this uh, trek if there was uh, not a flutist in our uh, team of trekkers every place where he would get tired he would sit, sit down and he would play a short tune and we would again get up and start trekking the sense of humor is like that it is like having a flutist with you on a bad trek uh, and and uh, it helps it helps diffuse difficult situations it uh, helps get you out of terrible jams uh, sometimes uh, even when you overshoot a red light and the cop catches you a quick joke can help you avoid a bad chalan <laughs> i i developed a sense of humor because uh, the only library which was available sufficiently big in mumbai was the british council library and they used to have these books of pg woodhouse woodhouse so reading a lot of pg woodhouse in your teens helps is is a recommendation i would have <laughs> uh, you drink from the cup of life only to find a a dead beetle at the bottom <laughs> yes <laughs> Uh, Monica, any more questions for Sujit? Yes, we have a couple of, but I think we'll just try to take a, take a few in the interest of time. There's a question which came in from Ashish Vashisht. When you're chasing or living a dream and suddenly you make a mistake and it makes it impossible to achieve that dream, how do you come out of it? I think it is necessary to realize how, how far you've come from where you were. Uh, it, it, is, it is very hard, easy to be hard on ourselves and said that i could not achieve my dream i was substandard but if you look back at your journey and see how far you have come in life i think that should give you a, a quiet satisfaction that you are a better human being uh, than you were yesterday and ultimately that is what matters i don't think it is the bank balance or the toyota corolla thank you um, just connected to this dream question there's one more can you elaborate a little more on this uh, dream articulation point? It was, I think people want to hear more on that. Very well. Uh, take a, it's, uh, the ingredients required, a piece of paper and a stub of pencil or a pen. Sit down in a quiet place and start writing down everything that you want to dream. You, Gadi, Bangla, car, your bank balance, you think of it, write it down. 
try to get 100 dreams. I can challenge you in the first sitting, you will maybe reach 20, 25. It has taken me 30 years to reach 55 dreams. To write it down, not fulfill it. Of the 55, 56 dreams, since I started writing it down in 99, I have been able to fulfill about 12 or 13 and the biggest ones first. Okay. Now, the writing of the dreams is not the important part. The visualization is the important part. Can we, can you feel it so much that it is real? If, if you are, uh, you know, uh, uh, taking a cruise uh, in the, you know, Queen Mary or Queen Elizabeth II, can you hear the sound of the waves? Can you feel the wooden planking underneath your feet? Can you taste the canapes as they are served to you? Can you see the uniform of the person who is serving it to you? The visualization is very important. What this does is it sends a very powerful subconscious message deep into your head and your brain keeps working all the eight hours that you're sleeping and it makes it happen. Whoa, that, you know, Shah Rukh Khan dialogue, Puri kainat lag jati nahi, kainat nahi lagti hai. It is right between these two years of yours. Your mind is working over time to make it a reality. Once you start visualizing, it makes it a reality. The power, power of visualization is very, very, very effective in uh, achieving outcomes. As they say, whether you can do it or you can't do it, it is all in your mind. Once you visualize success or failure, you get it. What I'm telling you is to follow a discipline, to chase your dreams, to visualize your dreams down to the last, last detail. How will that party look that you want to attend with Amitabh Bachchan or Dilip Vengsarkar or you name it, your hero? What will it look like? What are you dressed in? Who are there with you? How does the clinking of plates and cups and dishes sound at that moment? What is being served? Visualize. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for all the inspiring and thought-provoking details that you've shared.